Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Haider al Abadi, the Prime Minister of Iraq, visited Washington on Tuesday, cap in hand for humanitarian assistance for millions of people displaced by the war against IS in Iraq. President Obama promised him 200 million, but this appears to be inadequate given the number of displaced refugees from the war. He needs billions of dollars more to manage the crisis. The prime minister is headed to the World Bank and IMF later this week to raise more funds. In the meantime, U.S.-led airstrikes in Iraq and Syria are continuing with more vigor in fighting back the IS in Iraq than in Syria. The U.S. military reported that it conducted three airstrikes against the IS in Syria and 15 airstrikes against the group in Iraq. The toll on the civilians in the area being bombed are in the millions and becoming unmanageable, according to the U.N. Joining me now to discuss the situation in the ground in Syria and in Iraq is Rhys Ehrlich. He is a best-selling book author and a freelance journalist who writes regularly for the Global Post, Vice News, and NPR. His most recent book is Inside Syria, the backstory of this civil war and what the world can expect. Thank you so much for joining me, Rhys. Glad to be here. Rhys, tell us about these latest developments in the campaign against uh, the IS in Iraq and in Syria. Well, it's kind of gotten lost in the news because of the Iran talks and other crises, but the U.S. continues to bomb uh, ISIS targets in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, and particularly in Syria, uh, it doesn't have a lot of impact because other than the Kurdish Peshmerga, uh, the, there's no allies on the ground who are uh, fighting with the U.S. So an air war has very limited impact. And uh, we don't hear a lot about it because it's not going very well. The, uh, uh, both uh, the uh, Assad government continues in power in, in parts of uh, Syria, and the ISIS uh, continues to make some advances despite the air war by the U.S. Now, Reese, one particular and peculiar thing here is that uh, the Iraqi forces are here fighting the uh, ISIS, is being supported uh, by air, by the United States, and by on the ground uh, with some military leadership and strategists uh, from Iran uh, making strange bedfellows. What do you make of that? Well, I think this is part of the uh, inherent contradiction of the latest U.S. war in Iraq. Uh, we lost the first war by uh, pulling all the troops out and all closing all the military bases. Uh, a pro-Iranian government came to power, uh, much to the chagrin of the U.S., and now the U.S. is trying to reverse that. But it's not going to be easy, because you can't win a war through air power alone. And the, the allies, again, except for the, uh, uh, the Kurdish militia and um, the Kurdish region of Iraq, uh, there are no pro-U.S. allies on the ground. The most effective fighting forces are the militias allied with Iran. There was an interesting article in the New York Times just uh, yesterday or today pointing out that some of the soldiers being trained by the U.S. in the, in the Iraqi army take their days off and go fight with the militias that are pro-Iranian. So at the end of the day, if ISIS is defeated, Iran is going to emerge as a stronger power in Iraq, not the United States. And, of course, this is making um, Israel very tense, uh, and, uh, and they're watching the situation uh, carefully. What does this do to the relationship between Israel and the U.S.? Well, I think uh, the Israelis have the same problem in Iraq and Syria as the U.S., which is if the U.S. can't find any allies on the ground, the Israelis have an even harder time, given their reputation in the Middle East. I think the biggest conflict right now between the U.S. and Israel is over the new talks uh, with Iran. And what's going on there is uh, uh, Netanyahu told a cabinet meeting, and this was in the Haaretz article yesterday, that uh, the worst thing that could happen is if Iran lived up to its, all of its commitments on the nuclear issue and didn't build a bomb for, uh, or have a bomb program for 15 years. Now, it seems a little ironic. Why would uh, Israel be worried about that? Well, because the issue really isn't about nuclear weapons and Iran attacking Israel. The issue is about Iran as a regional power. And if sanctions are lifted, 
uh, Israel is worried that uh, Iran will expand as a nuclear power. So that conflict is quite real between the U.S. and Israel. And then uh, what's happening in Yemen has to be factored in here as well, um, given that, you know, the Saudis are, are still carrying out its campaign in, in Yemen. And what does this tell us about what uh, the, the tug and pull that's going on between the Saudis and the Iranians? Well, the, uh, some are saying it's a proxy war, but it's really a war of aggression by Saudi Arabia against Yemen. Uh, Iran supports the Houthis politically. Maybe they're sending some money in arms, although that's not been proven. But uh, that doesn't justify an aerial attack and possible invasion by Saudi Arabia and its allies. The, uh, you know, the old government uh, in Yemen that was pro-U.S. and pro-Saudi was corrupt and ineffective. The Houthi rebels who have been fighting in uh, Yemen for a long time, uh, took over the capital of Sana'a and uh, controlled basically much, much of Aden, the second largest city. And uh, the Saudis can't win a war by air power alone. Uh, and they're going to learn the same lesson that the U.S. did, which is it's easy to get in and proclaim victory through air bombardment. It's quite something else again to get out and have a pro-Saudi uh, government left in uh, Yemen. And I think we're going to see this war go on uh, for some time. Riz, how do we know that the Iranians are actually assisting the Houthis here? Well, we don't. What we have is uh, the U.S. says that, uh, and honestly, I think, and accurately, that the Houthis are not proxies or they're not tools of Iran. They are an indigenous rebel movement. Uh, they have their own problems. They're allied with the old uh, dictatorship, for example, the old dictator Saleh. So it's not like they're great guys, but to characterize them as tools of uh, Iran is simply wrong. And the, the Saudis, like every aggressive power, want to uh, have a reason to get people very mad and to justify their activities. Say, aha, this is an example of Iranian expansion while they're using it as an excuse to expand Saudi rule. Uh, but, you know, you can't um, uh, govern through air power. Somebody on the ground has to support the Saudi position. And so far, those who do are on the losing side. And uh, getting back to Syria here, um, what's going to be unfolding in the next uh, little while that you think uh, we should be paying attention to? Well, uh, there's a real crisis in Yarmouk, which is the part of Damascus, often referred to as the Palestinian refugee camp, although it's simply a poor neighborhood in Damascus that I've visited many times. Just in the last week or so, the Islamic State has taken over that uh, area of Yarmouk and causing a great deal of uh, problems both for the government of Assad and for the other rebels who had been fighting there. It was an area of roughly 200,000 people. It's down to 18,000 now. The Assad government has laid siege to it. So uh, it's very difficult to get in and out, to get food or supplies in and out. And so it's a real humanitarian crisis. The civilians of Yarmouk are caught between the Islamic State on the one side and Assad and his allies on the other. And uh, if this plays out, if the Islamic State is able to consolidate its power in that area, that's very, uh, bodes very badly for the Assad government because it is basically part of Damascus. It's the closest they've come to the center of the city. Uh, so with, uh, I would watch, and I'm watching very carefully to see what happens in Yarmouk. And uh, the UN uh, re says that uh, Syria has generated the largest number of refugees and displaced people in the world at this point. Um, what is happening to uh, folks caught in between uh, this war? Yeah, the, uh, before the war started, uh, Syria was roughly 24 million people. Some 6 million people at least are now either forced to flee the country or have been displaced within the country. It's a massive humanitarian crisis. Neighboring countries are doing what they can. Uh, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon are trying to absorb these uh, millions of refugees. Uh, but it's a, a real humanitarian uh, tragedy what's going on. The irony is the U.S. has plenty of money for bombing in Syria and in Iraq, but uh, it's coming up short when it comes to U.N. agencies asking for uh, the U.S. to make its commitments for humanitarian aid. Uh, 
UNESCO, UNRWA, various UN agencies are short of cash because of the crisis. So the U.S. is rather hypocritical in uh, continuing to bomb, somehow managing to come up with the money for bombing, but not to make its commitments uh, to the UN agencies. The UN has sent special envoys uh, to Damascus uh, in an effort to lift the siege in Yarmouk and to allow food and emergency and uh, medical supplies into the to the area. It's it's very tricky to say the least because the Assad government doesn't is using the uh, siege of the town as a way to starve out the, the rebels uh, and uh, therefore is either doesn't allow supplies in or allows it on a very limited basis. Um, but the UN is uh, trying to do what it can. And when permission is given, they've been able at times to bring in some truckloads of supplies, uh, but still not anywhere near enough. And uh, about the uh, recent findings of use of chemical uh, materials, uh, how do we know that and to what degree do we know it's taking place? Well, Human Rights Watch, among others, has uh, said that the Assad government recently has been using chemical weapons, specifically uh, chlorine gas, uh, that they mix into the barrel bombs, there are these 50-gallon uh, oil drums that are packed with shrapnel and explosives. Uh, the, they, you can go online and see their, uh, uh, the information that they provide on that. There's also been incredible reports that the ISIS has been using quick, uh, chlorine gas on a limited scale. Um, the problem is uh, these use of chemical, ga chemical weapons is, of course, prohibited under international law. It's also not a very effective weapon because it can, under certain circumstances, can blow back on your own troops. So it's mainly used against civilian targets, which makes it even worse. And what are the consequences of the, this chemical gas? Well, if, depending on how close you are when it explodes, you can die from it or you can be per your lungs can be permanently injured. You remember uh, veterans from World War I for decades after the war suffered from exposure to chlorine gas that was used widely by both sides in that war. So uh, depending on, on how close you are, it can be very uh, dangerous. Rhys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.